Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Anthony Cross. I'm the Public Transport Network Manager at, at Auckland Transport, and it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here today and to introduce Jarrett Walker, who's going to speak to us to address the question, how will an integrated public transport network create a city for people here in Auckland? So jarrett has been working full-time as a transport consultant for more than 20 years. He's based in Portland, Oregon, and he, where he's lived for most of his life, I believe, and uh, remembers as a teenager in the 1970s when Portland committed to being a city for people rather than cars. Um, Jarrett initially did his uh, academic study. He has a doctorate in theatre arts and humanities from Stanford University. By his own admission, he is passionately interested in an impractical number of fields. And he thinks he is probably the only person who has peer-reviewed articles published in both the Journal of Transport Geography and Shakespeare Quarterly. <laughs> so Jarrett works in cities on both sides of the Pacific, and when he's here in New Zealand and on, in Australia, he's associated with the transport consultancy MR Cagney, who are sponsoring this event today and who've brought Jarrett to Auckland for this week and next week. So I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, MR Cagney for their sponsorship of this event. Uh, MR Cagney set up their office here in Auckland about 10 years ago when they were working on the um, concept design, leading the concept design for the Northern Busway. And subsequently they were in <coughs> have been involved in uh, changing the focus of the Amity project to some extent in terms of it being more public transport oriented. Um, and of course that's now being manifested in the, in the uh, about to be opened Panmure um, bus train interchange in the beginnings of a busway in East Auckland. I first met Jarrett a couple of years ago when I went out to a meeting at Auckland Transport's head office in Henderson um, to talk about the review of the regional public transport plan. I remember the day very well because Jarrett and I travelled back into Britomart on the train together about midday and the day was the 9th of September 2011, the opening day of the Rugby World Cup and there were about 20, 20 people standing on our, in our train carriage at midday at Henderson and we were leaving people behind as we went through stations subsequently and I remember ringing a colleague and back at back at uh, our office here at Bledisloe and saying, I think we've got a wee problem on our hands. Jarrett was, I just remember Jarrett sitting there being very bemused by all these people waving red and white flags and asking what country they were from and they were, they were Tongans obviously on that first day. So as a result of that first meeting, um, we, we ended up engaging Jarrett and MR Cagney to, to work with us on a fundamental restructure of Auckland's public transport network which we now refer to as the new network and which is now embodied in the recently adopted Regional Public Transport Plan for, for Auckland. So the principles of that network, a simple, legible and connected network of frequent services complementing the rail system and the Northern Busway have been very enthusiastically received, most recently when we consulted on the network for um, South Auckland. And so together with the new network, with integrated fares and ticketing, with the electric trains and with improvements to infrastructure, we see that public transport is going to take a much more important role in, in Auckland in the, in the years to come um, and will be much more integral to the fabric of Auckland and to the lives of more and more Aucklanders. But integrating public transport into the fabric is a, is a key issue, clearly. And that's what Jarrett is going to talk to us about uh, today. Uh, public transport needs to be a good citizen within Auckland and to relate well to the, uh, to the urban, urban areas and especially here in the city centre. Um, if it's to be effective and if better public transport and a better Auckland are, are to be um, mutually compatible. So I'll hand over to Jarrett now. There'll be time to, uh, to answer questions 
um, at the end of his presentation. Jarrett. Thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, I want to pick up on a couple of things that Anthony said by way of introduction. First of all, um, public transport works because committed public servants care passionately about it. And even at times when not everyone has necessarily cared that much about public transport in Auckland or been able to be bothered by the details, Anthony Cross is somebody who has cared very passionately. And you know you're in the presence of a real professional when something happens like that event on September 9th. Uh, my version of that story is a little different. What I remember is that relatively early in the day, uh, and of course the big events were that evening, relatively early in the day, Anthony was upset by certain crowding patterns that he was seeing on the trains and was calling up uh, the operator and, and wanting to make sure there was action on that. And I remember how passionate and how frustrated Anthony was by the fact that things weren't quite working. Uh, really on the morning of September 9th. And so, of course, by the evening of September 9th, I remember strolling from the Domain into Parnell under the railway tracks and seeing the immobilized trains full of rugby fans and the steam rising off of them, and I was seriously concerned that Anthony might be having a heart attack at that point <laughs> because he cares so much, and your public transport system is as good as it is and going to get better partly because you have people like Anthony Cross who care that much. Um, lest Anthony make it seem like I've lived in the same city all my life and therefore have no possible perspective on the world, I have lived in Portland, Oregon, except for the seven years I lived in San Francisco, the one year I lived in Vancouver, the five years I lived in Sydney, and the periods of months that I've lived in Oxford and in Paris. Uh, and you could say that I live in Portland, Oregon, but of course I am traveling about 60% of the time, so the entire concept of home is somewhat complex, especially when I get to tra travel to places that I love as much as Auckland. And I've been immensely grateful for the opportunity to work on the city. I think it's one of the most exciting cities in the world for reasons that have to do partly with the city's geography, partly with the city's potential, and partly just because of the wonderful way that New Zealand thinks and the wonderful things that are possible here. Um, I live in a country that is much more immobilized by ideology. I live in a country where lots of people think that working together with people who disagree with you is evidence of weakness. And it is a much harder place to get a lot of things done. So I would really bet on New Zealand and I'd bet on New Zealand's world city. And that's partly why I'm happy to be back here as often as anyone wants me to be involved in the wonderful transformations that are happening here. So. What if we could see in a visceral way the extent to which a public transport system liberates our lives? This little tool, um, which was developed as in beta by walkscore.com, and which I'm now involved in the next generation of, is a little t web tool where you can point your pointer down on a map. This is Portland, Oregon, my hometown. And it will show you these blobs, the Greek word is isochrones, showing you how far you can get, not just how far, but where you can get on transit plus walking, public transport plus walking. I'm an American, so I will sometimes use the word transit. I will also use the word ridership instead of patronage, because in America the word patronage means corruption. <laughs> um, and it's just easier to use the right word everywhere than to try to remember what country I'm in at any moment. So, um, the cool thing about this is that you can move your pointer around and see the consequences of your choice about where to locate. You can see the consequences of spending a little bit more to locate in the CBD as opposed to an inner city district perhaps comparable to Mount Eden, as opposed to a leafy suburb on a cul-de-sac, and how that will change public transport's utility to you. So one of the first things that this is, is an opportunity for you to take responsibility for the consequences of your own choices, which is why I very much want to see the day when every real estate listing online has a pointer to this tool so that nobody can ever choose a location and then complain about the public transport there. Public transport is largely a response to your location and it cannot be equally good everywhere. That's just not how it works. 
But then it also raises the, uh, an opportunity, this image of the isochrone also raises an opportunity to present the public transport question in a really visceral way, which is what if public transport's tasks were simply to grow these blobs for the greatest number of people? What if, in short, we were in the business of freedom and opportunity? Because that's what this is. In the context of urban life, this is a map of how much of the city is available to you. This map tells you whether you live in a city or whether you live in a village inside the city where you are essentially trapped because you've located in a place where public transport can't work well. So the questions, how much of the city in all its richness and opportunity is available to me? In other words, how free am I? We're barely talking about transportation at all, are we? And whenever you hear an engineer banging on in a way that seems kind of abstract about travel time, or about um, reliability or about any of those things, remember that the engineer in their own language is talking about your freedom. Now what, what causes a network to have these features? How do we grow the blobs? We grow the blobs, the math of this is that we grow the blobs by worrying about five variables, frequency, speed, span or duration of service, reliability and capacity. Now it turns out that among these, Frequency, in particular, is an awfully challenging thing to talk about. And I've encountered this all my career. Frequency and span, but particularly frequency, are invisible. You can't take a photograph of frequency. And in a world where we increasingly con communicate in photographs without even text attached, this is a problem. A map of, of a transit network doesn't, doesn't signify frequency unless it's been designed to. And many of the images that we routinely have about public transport, the insides and outsides of vehicle, the people who use it, you can get an enormous amount of information about public transport visually, and that can make you feel like you understand it without ever really confronting what frequency is. Frequency is hard to explain to someone who doesn't use transit. Regular public transport riders understand frequency very, very clearly because it's, it defines the experience of waiting. But in America in particular, and I'm working right now in Houston, for example, and in Houston I have the challenge of a, the, the, the decision makers of that city being virtually entirely motorists. And I have to find a way to explain why this thing called frequency matters. And I have to say things like, imagine there's a gate at the end of your driveway that only opens once an hour. If that were your problem, First of all, you'd feel trapped in your house, which is exactly how public transport passengers on low-frequency services feel. You'd trapped in their neighborhoods. And second, you'd probably realize that maybe instead of a wider freeway or speeding up the service, maybe the top priority is to get this frigging gate to open more often. Well, in public transport, that's expensive. Frequency is expensive. Double the frequency, you've doubled the cost of running the service, which is why we are obsessed now, especially in North America, with not just husbanding frequency, planning networks where the starting point is how do we maximize frequency? And the answer is, of course, we maximize frequency by running the fewest possible routes so that we can run each of them most frequently. That's why one of the things I'm proudest of about the Auckland Network Plan is that it dramatically cuts the number of routes in a system. And whenever you hear any public transport objective, uh, executive bragging about how many routes they operate, Please understand they are not bragging about the quality or quantity of their service, they are bragging about its complexity. It's about making the system simpler. And what's happening now, and, and I've had a, a major role in this, um, in, in spreading this idea, is that all over North America and Australia, we're seeing frequent network brands where the information system is being used to highlight where the frequency is and to help people understand why frequency matters. Slogans like turn up and go, the wait is over, the network for people in a hurry, and the slogan that I coined in my book, frequency is freedom, because frequency is freedom. More than anything else, the wait is what keeps us from public transport. And, the, and, and then, Public transport can only function as a network if it's easy to connect from one route to another, and that too is governed by frequency. Finally, when you think about the fact that frequency is also a backup for reliability, that when a bus breaks down, a high frequency service means there'll be another soon, frequency is actually a cubed value, and you should expect it to have very nonlinear payoffs. 
because so many different things improve as frequency improves. And that's, in fact, what we find. And that's why the frequent network is the very foundation of the new network concept for Auckland. So business as usual, if we had not done this network plan and if Anthony and his team and everyone else at AT were not putting such extraordinary effort into getting it consulted and implemented, you would be on a path by 2016 to have that frequent network. The network of frequent all-day service would basically be right around the CBD, the outer link, the rail and, and RTN lines, a couple, you know, Dominion Road, Mount Eden Road, the vast majority of Aucklanders would have no access to it. We discovered that if we put a priority on expanding the frequent network while still making sure that we had enough peak capacity, still making sure that every neighborhood had basic access, making sure of all those other things, that by 2016 the frequent network could look like this. Before, after. Before, after, before, after. How did we do that? That is how much waste is in your existing system. We've already gone to consultation in South Auckland, and among those who express an opinion, the opinions are about 70% positive, with quotations like this from real people whose liberty will be changed. I love the new network. I have the map pinned to my fridge. I've been telling my friends about it, thinking all the new places I'll be able to go to, and I want to let you know this comment is not from a transit-dependent person. This comment is not from someone who can't drive. This is a comment from someone who can drive, but who really hates driving. And one of the things to be aware of coming down on us is all this new information about distracted driving and about the dangers of doing things while you're driving. And more and more people are figuring out that driving time is really pretty wasted time and that if you really want to be able to do something with your travel time, you need to be on public transport because there are very few things that it is actually safe to do while driving, including anything that takes your eye off the road for a moment. That's going to sink in. The network is a massive, massive transformation for the isthmus. Extremely frequent service would cover most of the isthmus for spontaneous anywhere-to-anywhere -anywhere travel. Why the isthmus? Because the western two-thirds of the isthmus, which is what I'm really referring to, is perfect public transport geography in terms of density, in terms of walkability, in terms of the linearity of the paths available for public transport. And that's why we can deliver such extraordinary outcomes there. But frequency means quantity. And quantity requires careful scaling to make sure that we can maximize quantity and don't spend too much money on things that distract us from it, while still scaling for a network that's appropriate to what I'm going to call the middle 80 percent. And I'm going to come back to that. Here, however, is some of our obstacle. This is a network primarily of buses because buses are what you have, and we need to get this done quickly. Um, buses are the vehicle that you have that can cover the whole city and that, can, and that can be operated cheaply enough that they can be made available in abundance. And so we have, we have these kinds of comments coming back at us. These three comments are all direct quotations from someone or other that I've once heard say these things. But they're not necessarily from Aucklanders, although I'm sure that there are leading Aucklanders who hold these views. Um, the notion that buses have no place in a civilized city, that there's something about the bus that is so objectionable in terms of its sight, its noise, and fumes, that it must be excluded before we have achieved any, anything that can be called civilization. I have heard that in various words in multiple cities. A leading professor of architecture in a soiree that I once was able to attend was asking me what I did, and I was talking a little bit about the importance of complete public transport networks, and she said, but you mean buses? Yeah, well, that's part of it. And she said, but I simply wouldn't ride a bus. I simply wouldn't ride a bus. Okay, that's something we have to engage and understand and respond to. And finally, almost every interest group whom I have ever heard submit about public transport in the 20 years of my career has said something of the form, we care about these people, not those people. And I'm going to come back. I want to talk a bit now about each of those ideas, why they are understandable, and why successful public transport networks push back against them. 
Now, there are lots of reasons to hate Auckland buses. Some of them are old and smelly and noisy. The existing presentation of the bus system advertises complexity. You look at this sign and it tells you that if you can't figure out the difference between the 188, the 189, the 19X, and the 191, there's something wrong with you because we at AT understand it perfectly well. Um, all this complexity means it's hard to use the system spontaneously. Look at the barrier to figuring out how to make some trip that you don't make routinely. And as a result, you have this, the existing system has trained the people of Auckland that public transit port is mainly useful for a trip that you make regularly and know how to make. But that you really shouldn't go out and explore because you might get mixed up between the 189 and the 199X and end up on some remote street corner where the next bus will rescue you in an hour. This is all seemingly unrelated to civic goals, which are very much about the utility of public transport and about, and about achieving extraordinarily high levels of public transport use. And finally, partly as a result of their apparent complexity and their apparent poor utility, they seem to add little to the urban environment. And the low utility of buses shows on your bottom line there's a wonderful 2011 study of 11 peers of Auckland whose purpose was uh, to motivate Auckland to crawl out of the dungeon. Um, I think this doesn't begin to capture Auckland's potential, but it certainly is true that when you stack Auckland up against cities that are even of similar size but have much more sophisticated transit networks, um, you find that it's not doing very well. But now you have these things called the links, and they're very popular. And you know why they're popular? Because, because they're simple and they're frequent. Now, we don't necessarily advertise the frequency, but that's actually the foundation of it. The foundation of why, if you live in Ponsonby or Parnell or one of the other inner city services that are areas that are served by these buses, you know it's always coming. And you can see that list of all of the destinations along the top of the bus and know that if you hop on the bus, you'll get to all of them. The links are the key to a new vision of public transport, which is about advertising simplicity, advertising access, and welcoming spontaneous travel, not just your rigidly scheduled commute. And you could think of our proposed network as a whole network of simple, legible, frequent links. In fact, one way you could do it, there are about um, 20 or so uh, distinct frequent routes in the proposed isthmus network, and you probably could come up with 20 colors and 20 comparable liveries if you wanted and have a real rainbow experience as these things go through your city. That is one remarkable way of making service legible, and I want to congratulate New Zealanders for the courage to do it, because in North America, um, most of our public transport systems are so limited that, for example, the operating base is one giant stack and the buses have to come off the stack in whatever sequence they went in, and you could not possibly guarantee that you would put a blue bus on the blue route. That is something that your country is well ahead of America on. What this means for the CBD, a CBD that has to be about pedestrians and has to be about joy and the merging of joy with work, the merging of the errand with the spontaneous experience, um, you have to have abundant links that are frequent, legible, and direct so that when you are in Freiburg Square and you suddenly want to be in Ponsonby, it's obvious how to do that and you'll be there soon. That sense that the city is available. So the new network means all these things, this massive simplification. Uh, it, does so, it does cause a drop in CBD bus volumes, but it means the buses that remain are more important and are serving more people. Buses doing more work. Um, if you don't like buses, but you like pedestrians, I have to remind you that buses are fountains of pedestrians, spewing pedestrians into the urban environment where they will chop and work and do various interesting and surprising things that make a great city. Um, so facing that, how do I respond to this claim? I guess I'll give you a tour of some places where if buses have no place in a civilized city, we would have to call these places barbaric. Let's start with Paris. Paris, where I lived in the 1980s, has the world's densest metro network. There is no other city in the world where you are more likely to be right next to an underground subway station than Paris because the network is very dense. The stations are very close together. There's a station near practically everyone. When I lived in Paris in the 1980s, 
the consensus was that Metro is, is the real public transport system. And there are these stinking buses running around on the surface, getting in the way of our cars, which are mostly for unimportant people. And if we had a government that knew how to, that, that if we didn't have to take care of these unimportant people, we would be able to get these buses out of the way. And that was very consistent with a, the idea of a Paris that needed more space for cars. They had just built a freeway down one side of the Seine and were still in the process of planning for another, a project that has long since been mothballed. Now, the, 30 years later, no, 20 years later, uh, during the last decade especially, Paris has reached a completely different consensus. First, that transit must be abundant. Second, that we need fewer cars and we must do absolutely whatever it takes to make public, not to push people onto public transport, but rather to attract them. And that therefore, buses simply must succeed. They simply must. And so let's look a little bit about what the bus has become just in the last decade in Paris. First of all, you see the interior of that vehicle, and sometimes I will throw that thing up and say, hey, can anyone tell me if we're on a bus or a tram? It actually takes a while to see the wheel wells that would signify that this is a bus. Every effort has ma been made to minimize the, vi the, pr the felt difference between riding a bus and riding a tram. Not that there isn't still a difference, but that buses with their ability to be so abundant have to be made attractive. That's the calculation, because you start with the urgent need for the sheer abundance of it. Buses in Paris are transparent. Absolutely no bus wraps whatsoever. Absolutely nothing covering the windows ever. That is also the rule in Portland, Oregon, where I am from. There's something interesting going on when you put something on the windows that makes a bus opaque. First of all, it makes clear that you're more interested in the opinions of people outside the bus than inside the bus, right? Because you're talking to people outside the bus. That may be true at a certain moment in history, but watch out for what it really means. Second, human beings don't really like going into a space that they can't see into. Do you wonder why we have glassed conference rooms? Do you wonder why there's so much glass in our offices now? Human beings want to see where they're going. It's not pleasant to get onto something that you can't see into. This is my same objective, objection to overly tinted windows. Now, while this particular shade of green in the glass may strike you as a bit retro, um, the bus is completely transparent. You can see right through it and see what's going on the street on the other side. That transparency is saying, take us for granted. We're not here to sing and dance for you. Take us for granted. See right through us. We are just part of the transportation network. We are just part of the street. Exclusive lanes. The debate about exclusive lanes is difficult everywhere. But in Paris, a mayor by the name of Bernard Delanoe did a, uh, um, uh, said that something has to be completely transformed about the way Parisian streets operate. And they figured out that a multi-purpose lane that, that accommodated buses and bicycles was the solution. What did they do? Did they do an apologetic little demonstration project on one little street and hope that it would work? No, they converted the entire city at once. Every famous Parisian boulevard that you can think of now has a bus lane on it with buses going faster than the cars go. And once that happens and motorists see that, the motorists get on the buses. They're just being rational when they do that. This is, this is Rue de Faubourg Saint-Denis, which is one of the streets that climbs from the east bank uh, up to the Gare de l'Est in the east side of the city. The street only had two lanes. Actually, when I first lived in Paris, that was striped as three miserable narrow lanes where the cars kept going up onto the footpaths. Now it's striped this way, that gentle suggestive median. Half the street capacity is given over to public transport. You know why? Because half the people who move down the street are on the buses. So that's fair, isn't it? Finally, because they are so useful, they are celebrated by, the, by design. And this is the crucial message to urban designers everywhere, that we must celebrate what is useful and not be, uh, rather than expecting that our perspective as designers will somehow crush the mathematics of usefulness. That never happens. So the, so the um, extraordinarily sophisticated information systems, that's all the information you would ever find in a subway station on that stop, the local area map, the diagram of the route, several different ways of representing the service of that particular route. Again, the transparent bus, 
Um, you can see the people on the bus. We're not ashamed of, the, of our passengers. We, welcome, we want people to see other people on the bus. We want the sensation, too, that when you're in a bus on the street, you're still in the street. That's the other thing that transparency does. The old-fashioned bus is about removing yourself from the city and uh, into a storage unit where you will be stored for transportation purposes. Right? That's the, what the old bus is. The new transparent bus is you're still on the street. You're still in the city. This is part of the street. The people on the bus are part of the street, and they're part of the city. And that's why it's a good thing that you might want to be on the bus. Now let me go to the opposite extreme, because the one downside of Europe is that we take, is that people from this country especially take junkets to Europe, they go to Paris and London, they see wonderful public transport services, and then they say, but we're Auckland, we're not that dense, we're not that old, we don't have the necessary conditions for that, we can't do that here. And this just goes on and on. People keep going to Europe, coming back with pictures, and then other people say, but we're Auckland. Quit going to Europe, go to North America, go especially to the west coast of North America where you will encounter cities of your age, your economic structure, the closest thing you have to your direct competitors for prosperity on the Pacific Rim with similar economies, similar mixes of, of information and natural resources and so on. One of those cities is Portland, Oregon where I grew up and in 1978, at the same time that we were tearing out a waterfront freeway and starting the planning on our first light rail line, Portland also took, it would be the equivalent of taking Queen and Albert Streets and closing them to cars and setting them aside for buses. P plain old stinky buses because buses are so incredibly useful and so incredibly liberating, especially back then. Now this mall, as you see it here, no longer is quite, looks quite like this. It was remodeled in 2008 to add light rail tracks. And that's an important point. If you love light rail, you've got to love buses because every really great light, light, light rail line grew as a successful bus line. Except, of course, in Melbourne and Toronto where they, were never, where they were never taken out. But those are the exceptions. We have to work with the city that we have. So it's the successful bus line that, grows the great, that, that eventually grows the light rail line, and that's exactly what happened in Portland. Not that there are, of course, there are still plenty of buses on the, on the street. I'll talk more about that. 33 Fremont to 92nd Avenue, that sign says. It could not be more transparent about what it does. Everybody who sees the bus sees, get, and knows their way around Portland immediately knows what that bus is going to do. That's another kind of transparency. That little sign, the N symbol there, or this one with the SE symbol, that means the buses from this stop go to the southeast part of the city trying to be as transparent as possible. We're celebrating the fact that this particular place is associated with a particular part of the city. And if I had, had, if, if, if I had been involved in the design, I would have encouraged them to push further. Think of specific symbols from that part of the city that, are, that can be associated with this stop um, so that we have that strong sense. This is something I call, I think I coined this word, but let me know if I didn't, onward welcoming that in a great space, the architects have, you know, the, the architects and placemakers have this partly right. In a great space, there is a sense that the space itself is a great place to be. But we are also restless animals, and we will love a space more if there is also a sense of possibility about where we could go next. Think about being at the airport and how exciting it can be to just look up at that departure monitor and think of all the places that people are going to from here right now. That's onward welcoming. That's design that celebrates function. In, the, in Portland, the Hilton Hotel recently remodeled and had a choice between locating on the bus street here where it has only one lane of traffic plus its pullout for running valets. They could have moved their, their front door to the other side of the building where it would be on a car street, and actually a very, a very nice car street. They chose to keep it here because the bus mall was considered a more prestigious address. You can look at Vancouver, Canada, another city that, would, that functions almost entirely on buses, um, which has a very beautiful bus mall going through the center. Vancouver runs mostly on trolley buses. They run on wires, like the little ones in Wellington. Don't let Wellington shape your sense of what trolley buses can be. 
trolley buses can be considerably more powerful, considerably larger, and they can absolutely zoom up hills in a way that is sexier than anything I have ever seen a train do. Um, San Francisco. San Francisco. Shout out anyone if you know what company is headquartered in this building. Starts with T, Twitter. This is a, sorry, go back. This is a dumpy building. This was a dumpy building in a fairly derelict part of the city that nevertheless had spectacular public transport access. A part of the city that didn't have much shape or form, maybe a little bit analogous to parts of Newton um, in, uh, in this city. Um, and Twitter went into this building as their headquarters. And this, of course, was a rebellion against what Google and Apple and so on had all done with their big corporate ego parks out in the suburbs. Those companies have to run these enormously expensive shuttle systems because after moving out into these distant suburbs, they discovered that all of the best talent that they're competing for doesn't actually, isn't actually attracted to manicured lawns and jogging tracks by the creek. They would actually prefer to step over homeless people to get into seedy nightclubs where they have their best ideas. And so this is why San Francisco has now been so fantastically, has now become so fantastically expensive. A friend of mine here in the audience who I had dinner with last night, I almost shouted him dinner when I realized he was a poor graduate student, and then I remembered that he still owns a house in San Francisco, which means I don't really need to worry about him. Um, but that bus is part of why Twitter is there. That transparent bus Ordinary bus by American standards, but just fantastically useful. And you can see it's enormous because San Francisco moves fantastic numbers of people on them. And if you go to San Francisco and you talk to people there, you'll find you won't hear very often that buses have no place in a civilized city because they are just so useful. And what if we don't create workable space for buses in a CBD? Well, then you have Sydney. Sydney has a city rail loop. You want a city rail loop, you think that'll solve all your problems. Sydney already did that. They're building one light rail line, but they still need lots of buses for their inner areas. And unfortunately, the New South Wales government has never figured out how to study the CBD bus problem at the correct scale to actually address it. But, but Sydney shows you one thing, which is that hated wall of buses that people talk about. My business is being blocked by this wall of buses the wall of buses is not, a, is not about there being too many buses. The wall of buses is, is because the buses aren't moving. And if you create a situation like Sydney where the buses are trapped, then you have a wall of buses. If, on the other hand, you help buses move through the city expeditiously, then you don't. It's not really about the number of buses. So I want to come back to these other, this other comment. When a leading professor of architecture told me that she simply wouldn't ride a bus, I immediately thought of Edward Glazer's comment in his book, The Triumph of the City, that one's own tastes are rarely a sound basis for policy. This is an especially gentle reminder to those of us in the room who are in more or less elite positions. I had to gently remind this woman that although she knows far more about architecture and about urban design than I probably ever will, the fact that she is a leading professor of architecture means she is not an ordinary person. And she's not the average person. She, has, she is in the position economically and in the position in terms of her background to make very different kinds of trade-offs to what most people would make. And so I have to constantly remind, remember, please remember if you are fortunate enough to be a decision leader, that that makes you unusual and that your tastes may therefore not be like those of most people for exactly that reason. And so then we come to this. Now, I, will have, to, I have to tell you that in this city, as in every city other, I ever work in, when we're trying to build a public transport system that is useful to everyone, most of our submissions are of the form we care about these people more than we care about those people. Please focus on this demographic, not that demographic. It comes from both ends. At the high end, we get the expectation that we need to invest in expensive technologies and designs to appeal to an elite writer so that that professor of architecture will ride. What is the problem with that? There aren't very many of her. That is the very definition of being an elite. There aren't very many of you. 
And as a result, what we tend to find when we invest in those highly specialized services is small numbers of highly elite writers that don't make any sense on the bottom line. The low end, uh, uh, just now in my hometown, a group that fancies itself a group of transit advocates but is really an advocate of low income people who have enough time to engage in advocacy, have put out a paper demanding that rather than improving service as, as the agency is proposing to do, we should cut the fares. Think about what that means. When you say that we should cut the fares, you mean that we should specialize around the needs of people who are cost sensitive. And then when you say that we should cut the fares instead of increase the service, you're saying we should specialize around the needs of people who are money poor and time rich. Well, you know what? We hear a lot in public transport from people who are money poor and time rich because you have to be time rich to write submittals. And you have to be time rich to go to meetings. And this advice is very contrary to what we actually see in rider behavior where we see all of the people who are money poor and time poor really valuing public transport services that value their time. Because most low income people are time poor as well. They are really, really busy. And that's why we have to extrapolate their behavior, understand their behavior from what they do more than from what certain submittals tell us. What these have in common is that they are they are both examples of we hear about these people, not those people. And I cannot emphasize too strongly that if you are going to take that view, you are at war with the absolute mathematical foundation of public transport's success. Maximizing the number of people who find one vehicle useful is the very essence of public transport's success, and that means diversity. Diversity of people, diversity of their trip purposes, diversity of their incomes is the foundation of public transport success. And if you ride a really great public transport system, whether it's in London or, or San Francisco or wherever, you'll notice that diversity. You'll notice that the businessman in a three-piece suit is sitting next to the dishwasher in his favorite restaurant. That's how you know public transport has really succeeded. And that's why I say, we have to focus on that middle 80%. So to wrap up, because I have a literature background, I have lots of quotes in my head. I can tell you, for example, that down at Freiburg Square, where it says, to thine own self be true, up on the fountain, anyone with a literature background always giggles when they go by that, because they know that in Shakespeare, that's actually the punchline of a joke. And he didn't actually mean that that is an aphorism or is something that should inspire you. So, Western cultures, the philosopher Alan Watts once said, that Western cultures are particularly prone to eat the wrapper and throw away the food. And I think about that whenever I look at a display of protein bars or health bars, and I see, every, and I see the thing that I want fully obscured by a symbol of the thing that I want, namely the wrapper. What's more, sometimes, very frequently, the wrapper has a photograph of the bar on it. Right? Obscuring my view of the actual thing. And I have to make a choice entirely among symbols because I can't see the thing. This is a thing we do in our culture. We are very obsessed with symbols. We are very obsessed with symbols of success, symbols of sex, symbols of happiness, symbols of youth, symbols of what we want. The vehicle is the wrapper. The freedom to an opportunity to engage with your city is the food. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. That's uh, really useful and uh, thought-provoking and inspiring, and I'm sure it will generate uh, one or two questions. I think we've got Susan. We've got about 20 minutes, I think, for for questions. Uh, Su Susan's got a microphone, there might be one or two others around as well. Graham East at the back there. Just a minute, Graham, there's a microphone. Uh, Graham East from Campaign for Better Transport. Um, question about, uh, it's great having the freq fast and frequent route as the, the spine of your transport system, but a lot of people don't live close to those routes. So feeder services come in, 
which can be smaller vehicles, possibly um, uh, not quite like taxis, but where uh, perhaps they're not scheduled services, perhaps they're on demand, whatever. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how that part of the network would best be facilitated or engineered? The success of public transport is overwhelmingly driven by the land use pattern through which it operates. And if you want to help anyone understand what a public transport friendly land use pattern looks like, ask them to think about this question, how far does the bus or tram have to drive to serve a thousand people or jobs? And if you're going down Queen Street, in the CBD, the answer is probably 100 meters or less. If you're going down Great North Road through the inner west of the city, the answer is probably several hundred meters, maybe a kilometer. If you're going down Great North Road somewhere out between Newland and Henderson, it's probably a little longer than that. But if you're wandering up a squiggly road behind Titirangi into the Waitakeries, the answer may be quite a number of Ks. So that test helps explain why some people get frequent service and some people don't. And it actually comes apart into three parts if you think about that test. One is sheer density. How many people are there? How many jobs are there that we are serving by driving down this particular street? The second is walkability, a particularly quantified sense of walkability, which is how many people can walk out through whatever barriers the local street network has created. And the third is the linearity of the transit path. Does the transit vehicle have to wander around in circles in order to go through this area? That too means it has to drive further to serve the same number of people. The frequent network responds inevitably to those realities. If you live in an area that does not have those features and therefore is not on the frequent network, you're going to have a less frequent service and what we did in the network plan was to identify that there are certain less frequent services that could probably eventually grow into frequent services. I think Hillsborough Road is a nice example. Um, not quite there yet, but something which in the context of a more useful network might eventually support that. Um, but then there are places that really won't. The little squiggles, nooks and crannies, um, um, places where the street network is just too hostile. And there, it's not about the size of the vehicle, it's about the fact that we have to pay the driver. And it's about the cost of the driver's time. And so when we have to run into an area with lower potential, we have to either run less service, which is what we do under the current regime, or mathematically, the other answer is pay the driver less. And Vancouver is an example of an interesting city where they have come up with an industrial regime in which driving little buses into the squiggles carrying few people is actually your training job. And you do that for a few years before you're allowed to drive a big bus. And as a result, they're able to provide abundant small bus service into the squiggles. But remember, it's not because the buses are small. It's because they have an industrial arrangement that makes that possible for them. Um, if you, the, the other thing that's coming down the line, is that various forms of subsidized taxi, and then finally, for the techno geeks in the room, you've all heard about driverless cars, which raises the possibility of the driverless taxi. When we get there, we have different ideas about how long we'll get there, um, I would expect that something like that will abolish the need for public transport in low density, squiggly, hard to get into areas it won't begin to affect public transport on the frequent network because the volumes of people that were moving along the frequent network, you do not want to have to accommodate in separate little vehicles but with walls between every pair of travelers. So that's the long answer to that. A shorter answer is the Auckland network plan doesn't completely cut service to anyone, but the, the, the availability of the frequent service has to respond to a geography that's favorable to it. Okay, one more, whoops. <coughs> I'm Susan McIntosh, happy Northern Busway user. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, would you recommend the London system of a flat fee for your trip, no matter how far or how short, in a certain zone? The, um, the big European cities, um, and a lot of big cities, have a general approach to fares, which is that in the core part of the city, where, frankly, you probably spent most of your time if you were a tourist there, um, there's a flat fare. 
And then as you get out long distances but are also dealing with smaller numbers of people, it becomes practical to charge distance fares. I personally like that. I'm used to it. I think the most important thing a fare system can do, apart from raise needed revenue, is get out of the way and avoid creating complexity or further barriers to use. And so fare complexity, I think, is the enemy of attractive, easy to use public transport. And um, I don't have, I, I understand the argument for microscopically distance based fares. Um, you can argue that once we have smart cards and no longer, that most of us who aren't that sensitive to one dollar here or there will just use smart cards and will no longer care about the complexity of the fare. Um, but I think that's a very, very interesting debate. Thank you, Jarrett. Um, I'm Jim Clark uh, from Auckland Council. Um, you spoke of the relationship between uh, walkability and transit is, is combining to freedom. Interested of your comments um, around uh, the relationship between cycling and transit, and maybe you could draw on what you're alluding to with that bus cycle lane in Paris. Sure. Um, cycling is wonderful. Cycling has, go in the new world, by which I mean an area that includes North America and your country and Australia, has gone through the in this interesting history that much of the first advocacy came from a very athletic cyclist who was relatively courageous and able to do things that most of us would not be comfortable doing on a bicycle. And so we're gradually now seeing the, um, the uh, emergence of a more European model of cycling where there's much more emphasis on moderate speeds and on safety rather than on high speeds and let's put it, you know, a somewhat different trade-off about risk. Portland is a great city to visit. If you want to study cycling, so is Vancouver. I strongly suggest, as it comes back to my theme, please, more junkets to Western North America, fewer junkets to Europe. Europe will inspire you as a kind of paradise in many ways, but it is not going to give you the practical tools for how to do that here in your city, in your economic conditions, whereas Vancouver, Portland, Seattle, those are cities that you will recognize as cities very similar to yours. Um, Port in Portland, cycling is the only mode that is really growing at the expense of the private car. That's partly because we can't afford to exp expand our public transport system right now. Um, and I don't have any concern about cycling as a competitor to public transport at all. It always seems to be a win-win when we invest in cycling infrastructure, as long as I can get the cycling advocates to kind of try to stay on that page as well. And some of them are extreme or not. Some of them really think that everybody should be a cyclist and then we won't need all these stinking buses. But that's not really how it's worked. Um, I do think that the integration of cycling into transit is something that uh, is happening very rapidly on the coast I live on. Uh, it's happening mostly in the form of secured bicycle parking rather than in the form of taking lots of bicycles onto a public transport vehicle. Taking bicycles onto a public transport vehicle, include whether it's using racks on the exterior or coming inside of a tram, is one of those wonderful ideas that only works until it becomes popular and then there's no longer room for it. So it's not the real solution and that's why I think, you know, cycle parking is a very important part of, this, of the package. Thanks, Jeff. Any more, any other questions? Uh, one over here. Over here. This lady here. Hello, I'm Vivian. Uh, for well over a decade, there's been an architect here who's been promoting his idea of um, what he's called sky cabs, which are these pods holding 12 people that are, are sitting on like a rail, monorail, um, electrically operated that um, would, would serve certain parts of the city. And um, whenever he's done a, a presentation, it's made eminently good sense to me that it seemed to be an excellent way of actually coping with particularly areas where um, people were isolated, that they could be brought in on that system rather than adding more buses, um, which of course are run on diesel mm -hmm. and are polluting. And I just wonder what your feeling is to actually have that as another form of transport over and above what we have at ground level rather than having it also at um, upper level as well. I feel a certain tittering in the room as though there are responses to that among people. I noticed let, me, let me say this, um, and, and it's interesting because what you're describing is something sort of like a demand responsive monorail. Um, 
but the basic technology you're referring to is a monorail technology. That is to say, there is a structure up in the head above, up above our heads, and these things are running along it. And perhaps it is demand responsive, in which case it's called personal rapid transit, and you can go look at one of these at Heathrow Airport. Um, or it's fixed route, in which case it's what we call a conventional monorail. Here's the issue. We spend money on infrastructure in order to benefit lots of people. That is why low demand public transport services are necessarily low infrastructure public transport services. And so when we talk about any way of, it is, it is the need to move large numbers of people efficiently, especially the need to move large numbers of people with a single driver that motivates us to go to rail at all. So this is why rail is often the right solution for our liberty, namely when, we, when lots and lots of people need to move as on your major rail lines and you want to be able to move 1,000 people with a single driver, remembering that the driver is the main cost. Um, I actually got an email last night uh, from someone saying, looking forward to hearing your talk today and hoping you'll be able to say something about monorails. It wasn't me. I know. <laughs> all, I can say, all I can say, excuse me, is that I, I think by now I have said something about monorails. They're a very nice wrapper. Um, they want, when you decide that, that the solution Generally speaking, we go into the third dimension because we can't solve our problems on the surface. Every problem is cheaper to solve on the surface. Paris remains a city that solves its problems on the surface. It helps that they already have a very dense metro. Um, but in the cities that have tried to have conversations about elevated structure, and the, and the two most obvious ones to think of are Seattle and Sydney. Um, Sydney, as you probably know, in one of the classic examples of the fallacy of transit tourism, sent a bunch, did a junket to Seattle back in the early 1980s, and a bunch of civic leaders from Sydney said, whoa, this little monorail in Seattle is really cool. We should get one of those and take it home. It's kind of like, you know, you go to Australia, you have fun, you hug a koala, you get a picture of a koala, you buy a stuffed koala, you take it home, and it ends up under the couch covered with lint. That's kind of the narrative. They discovered when they got it home and put it up, that it wasn't really useful to very many people. And you know what? It, Sydney's streets are already narrow enough. And once you put that thing up in the air over people, it created an urban design disaster. It was really unpleasant to be under on the narrow streets of the, of, around Town Hall. And so as you probably know, they just tore it down. Um, Seattle, on the other hand, went through a different adventure. They had a little old monorail, which they knew was kind of useless but great for tourists. And, but because they had that example, because people, Seattleites could visualize it, something got going called the Seattle Monorail Project about uh, in 1995. Voters passed an, am an amendment to, we need to do something about public transport. These monorail people think they have an answer. Give them a chance. And so the Seattle Monorail Project went forward as, and for 10 years struggled to, to build consensus around a specific monorail. And the problem was that unlike the idea of monorails in general, a specific monorail is outside somebody's window, somebody's spe some specific person's window, and o hanging over some specific street. And everybody wanted it somewhere else, fundamentally, because um, one of the things that I think the urban design profession has right right now in this generation at this moment of history is that we're justly suspicious of solving our problems up in the air because those become things that hang over us and that limit our sense of being comfortably outdoors in a real city the way we want to be. So I don't have a, I don't have a definitive opinion about a monorail. I can think of situations where a monorail is appropriate there's a situation in New Delhi, for example, where they desperately need high-capacity transit through a historic area rich with archaeological resources. They're not going to dig there. They have to do that elevated. But again, it needs to start with the mobility purpose, the freedom purpose, the liberation purpose, and then if the monorail is the right wrapper for that, then fine. Yeah, if I can just add to that before we have another couple of questions, I think we, we do often get that that sort of response to our current public transport problem, I often respond by saying, but the technology, for example, whatever it might be, might be the right thing to do in 10 or 15 years' time, but we've still got to do something 
in that 10-year period before we can implement whatever that technology might be. Mm -hmm. And that's what our new network is a response to, if you like. It's about using our current resources and using them more effectively. It doesn't stop us from thinking about other things that we might do in the future. Absolutely. So, and we've got time for another couple of questions, one at the front here. Hi, Jamie Walton. Um, I just wanted to uh, your thoughts on, um, well, this year, a couple of New Zealand scientists uh, won a, an award for um, electric induction from like a buried cable for electric vehicles. And they're thinking of starting it out like at taxi ranks so that electric taxis can recharge while they're waiting at a rank. But they eventually think that these things, as roads are being um, resurfaced or whatever, be buried under the roads, probably on, on main routes first. So could you have like um, driverless, oh and as you probably know in Toulouse they have a driverless metro system and in Bordeaux they have trams that um, with, with no wires so it's only, it's only live as the vehicle is actually over that section of track. So I think this is the way that the, um, these, these buried induction cable things would work with the electric vehicles, it'd only be like a pulse as the, um, in the vicinity of the vehicle. Um, so could you see all that, you're talking about the main cost being drivers, could you see these sorts of um, electric induction driverless vehicles being able to reduce the cost and extent of public transport? You're talking about two different things that are actually quite separable. Um, propulsion, electric versus diesel, electric versus internal combustion. There's an extraordinary amount of interesting work happening on propulsion. And there's no reason to believe that the smelly diesel bus is going to be, uh, is going to be the same even in 15 years. Um, there is also, of course, always been the option of the trolley bus. There's all sorts of interesting work being done on induction that could eventually make more of our public transport services electric. But remember, the abundance is even more than that. You know, the number of people we can attract onto public transport by making the service abundant displaces so many car trips that even if we are a diesel vehicle, we are still coming out ahead on almost all of your environmental measures. So it's important. That's also a slightly symbolic concern. I'm all for it. I think it's going to make public transport vehicles more acceptable in, in communities, and I think that's great. The other thing that no city should do is wager its economy on a technology that is still more or less in beta or in a demonstration project state. And I, th I realize this causes endless frustration for inventors who need some city to, to be the beta. But there have just been too many bad betas. And it's a very, and you know, people who have been in the business as long as I have have, have, had, have heard so many technology pitches and they all sound good. And you know, better try them out in like an amusement park or some sort of small context where you can really try them out first. Um, the, the driverlessness is a different issue. Um, Google, of course, thinks that we are all comfortable with the idea that we can step out into Queen Street knowing that that vehicle coming at us is driven by a computer and that that means it's going to stop when it sees us. And yes, that's actually probably technically true that it's more likely to stop. Um, I think we're a long way from actually being ready to accept that in that road running context. However, as you mentioned, driverless rapid transit is happening. That's a, the rapid transit, you know, running down a subway track, it's a much easier problem than driving. And as a result, it's a much easier thing to make driverless and it's already been done. If you come to the west coast of North America, it will show you a system in Vancouver that has been running on driverless since 1986. That's a pretty accepted technology for rapid transit now. Generally, though, entirely grade separated, so I'm not necessarily recommending it for your trains here. I'm going to ask uh, Ludo Campbell-Reed to wrap up the session in a minute, but in, uh, is there just perhaps one last question for Jarrett? Just one in the front here. A microphone coming for you, sir. Sorry, I'm sure you have. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Um, apart from the 20 states that I've been to, the United States, best public transport system I've been in is Prague. Have you been there? I've been to Prague, yes. Beautiful. Problem I have with Auckland Transport, and I came with it this morning, we have, particularly in South Auckland, I would say, is an inconsiderate rabble that uses the public transport. There's no education on how to use it. We have 
loud iPods, usually with rap. If you don't like that, you might as well get off the, the bus or the train. People get on the front, uh, sorry, get off the front and hold, hold, the, hold the, um, the bus up. In the middle part of the day, the buses in our area are usually about half an hour to three quarters an hour late. And what I want to ask Jared is public education and how to use public transport, I think, is very important. A lady mentioned the Northern Busway. Brilliant. The people that use that are brilliant. And there's such a variation, but there's no public education on it. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Um, there's something else you're raising, though, which is, I mean, uh, I'm glad to know that in New Zealand there's this confidence that education is all you need to change people's behavior. <laughs> in America, we are a little more cynical about this and accept that a certain number of people are going to misbehave anyway. And this is very important because one of the major, this one of the sort of canary in the coal mine situations, one of the signs that your public transport is going into a death spiral is when the people who misbehave seem to be the dominant presence or seem to be controlling the environment. And the only antidote for this is to, f it, it, is to fight back against it very hard by doing everything you can to create public transport services that are useful to enough people. Because in San Francisco, when people misbehave on the bus, there is somebody right next to them who tells them to cut it out and who shames them and who calls the police if that's necessary because there are so many people on the bus and because everybody on that bus knows that, that people who misbehave on the bus are attacking the city's economy. You know, anything that pushes people away from public transport is an attack on the city's economy and you just don't put up with that. So it's just a matter of changing the mood on the bus, the calculation on the bus, so that, and what you find is that the misbehaving rabble, I think was your term, simply behave better when they are being watched. And although in, in America we watch a lot of them with security cameras now, there's nothing like ordinary people being around you to make you behave, ultimately, and we see that everywhere. Thank you so much for that question. Thanks, Jarrett. Uh, I'll hand over to Ludo now. Lime, it's a packed room. I just was sitting in the front for about an hour and then turned around and uh, it's extraordinary. So thank you everybody for coming. What a, a great session. I suppose, uh, Jarrett, you know, there's a lot of wisdom there and a lot of skill, expertise. And I think, I, I think people need to be very positive about what's going on here in Auckland. I was uh, part of a, a session this morning uh, with the, the chief executive talking about the, the, something that sounds a bit boring to some people here, but the new long-term plan. Which is the new, which is in effect the group business plan for the council over the next 10 years. It's a very important document. It's where we're going to be putting our money and where we're going to not be putting our money. It's a very important point. Uh, the last three years has been the old legacy council's business plans just delivered forward for three more years. Those legacy councils never had the Auckland plan, they never had the city centre master plan. They never had an economic development strategy for the region. And I think there's a very important point we're about to get to, where here we are with Auckland Transport again. I've spent some years at Auckland City Council fighting my traffic engineering colleagues and them seeing me as, as a pariah, uh, the devil reincarnate. And that is no longer the conversation that we're having. We're doing this together with these people. They are colleagues and we are all working together. And I think, Jared, you might also reflect on a, a city that is changing as well, that's maturing, uh, kind of growing up, not behaving like, uh, like children anymore. And, you know, I think this is a, a really key piece in, the, in the, the history of Auckland. And so, you know, Jared's points today are really, really important. And I think a few things that struck me, I thought the idea of the, the conversation around frequency is freedom. And I, you know, I kind of get an emotional kind of person, that's the way I am, but I think it goes very deep, that, that point. Um, you, you couldn't be more right, actually. Um, the issue around quality, not just quantity. So the, I, I like the idea of less roots, more, sim more simplicity, rather than more roots, more complexity. It, it just really is a change of, of attitude. Um, low PT is a barrier to spontaneity. I mean, that's exactly right. You know, you want to be able to say to your wife and children, let's just let's get on the bus and head up Lake Road. 
you know, where I live in Devonport, we feel quite isolated down there. You've got to get a car out of Devonport, get the ferry. But, you know, Lake Road used to have a, a tram running up and down it, um, you know, 50, 60 years ago. 1956, Auckland's PT, um, passenger trips a year, probably 110 million trips a year. Uh, we've got to 70 billion. Um, well done. That's fantastic. We're moving in the right direction. But, you know, it's, it's in a way not so much brave new world, but back to the future. So I also support your point about monorails and new technology. I'm not too sure whether we are confident of those things yet. And that's another piece of this is about confidence in the PT network. Um, buses are fountains of pedestrians. I mean, that's just brilliant. That's exactly what we've got to do. Um, I could see a bus mall on Queen Street. You know, we don't, need, we don't need a pedestrian mall, but how about we get rid of the cars and put buses up and down? So we're talking with AT about that at this very moment. So there's some exciting things. Um, push, don't push people onto buses, but, but, but attract them onto buses. And that's a really key thing, I, that issue around bus wraps. You know, if you're in a car and you're behind a bus, it's almost like driving without your wing mirrors or without your rear view mirror. You can't, the bus is a huge obstacle. You can't see past it, you can't see through it, you can't see around it. It's quite intimidating. So the bus wraps need to come, they need to be wrapped off, I think, and I, you know, that's something we need to talk to our colleagues, and I'm sure they're on with it. And compare with like-minded cities, not like-minded, but like cities. So stop comparing ourselves to, to Copenhagen and Stuttgart and Dusseldorf and all these places, but compare ourselves to Melbourne. Uh, who actually took our trams off us and gave us their diesel, tra their diesel trains. So we have to learn from our mistakes and move forward. And Jared, you've been here many years now um, working as a consultant for the city. And I think you should be in it very, you know, very excited about the work that you've been doing. It's been a journey. Um, you're really here at a key point in our time. And I want to thank you very personally for all the help you've given us. Um, the conversation's less about attack and more about reward now. And I think you can also spot a, a changing of the guard, a changing of cultural mindset. So it's a very, very exciting time. So look, without you know, any more um, ado, the key thing, I guess, for me is really seeing that PT and city growth is part, are inextricably linked. And uh, we cannot have one without the other. Um, so that's the kind of key point for me. And uh, it's just a real privilege to work with people like Anthony, as you say, he's a great guy. And, and we're, we're all on the same page, a few moments where we don't disagree, but that's good. You know, perfection is boring, as I told my wife once. So, um, basically, um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. Um, thank you, our sponsors, M M MC, MR Cagney, Anthony and the team in Auckland Transport. It's great to be working with you guys so tightly. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Susan, you do a great job with all these conversations, as always. And um, thank you all for coming. And I think perhaps the next session we should have it. Well, not showgirls, that would be inappropriate, but some seedy nightclub to get the, uh, the conversations going. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for being here, and have a great day. It's a beautiful day outside. Enjoy Auckland. Thank you.